Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hive Reads. Today, I'm going to be reading a short story from Color Outside the Lines. It is edited by Sangu Mandana, and the story I'm reading today is called Death and the Maiden by Tara Sim. Parvani had never imagined facing death while dressed for a wedding, specifically dressed for her wedding. The mouth of the cave yawned before her, a condemned hole at the very edge of the world. The soft roar of waves rolled in from the ocean they had crossed to get here. This corner of the earth was wild and forgotten, and she felt like an intruder, a drop of ink or blood on an old crumbling page. No, she had not imagined death this way at all. A slow descent, like wading into water, swallowed by a darkness, stained. Her mother's hands rested on her shoulders. Parvani's vision of the world was stained crimson through her long wedding veil, embroidered at the edges with golden suns. Her mother's hands tightened on her shoulders, the bangles on her wrist chiming. You know what to do, she whispered in Parvani's ear. And she did. She would petition a foreign day for a death. She would avenge Ranya. Parvani swallowed. Turning slowly, she took in her mother's face, the tired lines at her mouth, the grief already settling in her eyes. Blinking her own watering eyes, Parvani hugged her. I'll find a way back, she said, somehow. Parvani turned back to the cave and took a deep breath, potentially her last. She would not look back at her mother. She wanted the last of her to live in the feeling of her kiss, warm and safe on her brow like a blessing. This is my choice. She took one step, then another. The hem of her dress whispered eagerly against cold stone. Another step, another. The shadows swallowed her feet. She lifted her ink-stained hands and let them also be fed into the gathering dark. It was hungry. It wanted her. A shudder rolled down her spine, a strange sort of ache settling into her limbs and her lower belly. As she wandered farther down, a weight began to grow around her. Dread seeped in like water through porous rocks. Breathing became difficult, and her heart faltered in her chest, until eventually it stopped beating. She panicked. Clutching her chest, she cast around for someone, anyone to help her. There was only the darkness, its tendrils caressing her face, as if telling her it would all be all right. Parvani sobbed. A shadow wiped her tears away. Is this what Rania had felt right before the end? The steady and terrible knowledge that she was about to become undone? You know what to do. This is my choice. Vengeance was a fragile word she held beside her now, held beside her now still hunt, but it forced her to keep stumbling blindly into the dark. Her hands grazed the sides of the cave. Here and there, she caught a glimmer of tourmaline, amethyst, a damantine. A breeze fluttered her veil. Whispers caught her ear. On the air was a scent of marigolds, thick and cloying. It almost reminded her of home. When she lifted her head, she saw that she had left the path. Before her was a cavern lit with soft blue, and somewhere beyond was the sound of rushing water. She drifted to an outcrop of stone in order to find the source of that water before a voice stopped her. The new queen finally arrives. She turned her head. Three women stood on the other side of the cavern, under a patch of algae that seemed to be giving off that ethereal, ethereal blue glow. Their skin was ebony, and their heads were shaved, their bodies crafted with long, elegant limbs and curves that would make a mountain range envious. Gold glittered upon them, on their shoulders, on their bellies, even on one's face, as if a foil had been grafted onto their flesh. They didn't speak any further, not even when she stood there and waited. They had called her Queen. Did they know where she ought to go? She opened her mouth to ask, but they retreated into a crevice, lips turned up in cruel smiles. It was in their black eyes, too, something more predator than human, a terrible rage contained. Parvani shivered. Out of the darkness, she finally began to feel the cold, 
She wrapped her arms about herself as she headed away from the three women and toward the sound of water. Queen. She did not come here to be a queen. She had come for only one thing, to end a man's life. If her request were granted. She emerged on a sandy bank that met the side of a flowing river like a hand cutting a cheek. Waiting on the shore was a long, sleek boat of gray wood, its sides painted green and orange. Swirling, intricate designs sprawled across the wood like the dye on her hands and feet. Hanging from the prow was a garland of marigolds. It stunned her. Had this been done for her? Did the god know of the cultures of her kingdom? Parvani kept shivering, but she forced herself to approach the boat, to carefully get inside and sit on the bench. There were no oars and no ferrymen, but the boat smoothly launched itself into the rolling water, taking her onward. Time passed, but she couldn't tell how much. She sat in her wedding vessel with her hands tightly clasped upon, clasped upon her lap, head down, eyes closed, drawing upon her waning strength to do what must be done. The sloshing song of the water began to ebb, and she opened her eyes. The boat had carried her all the way down the river into a small pocket of the lake. It birthed now at a rocky shore, beneath a growth of pointing stalactites. Pointing at the figure of a woman. Parvani swallowed her gasp. The woman was dressed in dark threads. A black veil hung from a crown, made of stag's horns, shockingly white, as if bleached by the sun. The woman stood silently, waiting for her to approach. When Parvani found that she could not move, the woman drifted to the side of the boat and raised a hand as pale as an ash. It took a moment for Parvani to unclasp her hands, now clammy and aching. She put one against the woman's palm and felt herself drawn up by a strength that surprised her. She somewhat clumsily got out of the boat and felt the sharp chill of the rocks beneath her soles. The woman studied her a moment. Through the veil, Parvani could see a pale face, long and thin, exquisitely beautiful. In fact, this close, she didn't seem a woman at all. She looked not much older than Parvani herself. But, of course, the subject of age was trivial when you were talking about a god. Parvani forced herself to swallow. She dipped her head and body in respect, fanning her crimson bridal gown around her. Hades, she whispered to the river cold rocks, I have come to be yours. She had grown up with the stories of other nations' gods, told in excited whispers, as if wickedly divine on the tongue. One of them was Hades and the Netherworld, the realm of gambling spirits and memory. For a bride was routinely given to the cave's mom, a girl, swallowed whole, to appease the sovereign of the dead. That was how Hades had found the strength to keep the Netherworld in balance. Without that power, the bridge between worlds would fade, until the living might as well have been called the dead. Parvani had never imagined volunteering to become one of those girls. Now, as she stood within a cluster of marble pillars, Hades herself before her, she still couldn't quite believe it. They kept their veils lowered. They were alone in the open-faced patio, its columns choked with creeping vines and jasmine. Beyond, she again heard the rush of water. It seemed to be everywhere. She couldn't stop trembling. When she'd first had this idea, she had been so certain, so determined. Now that it was unfolding before her, she wondered if she could truly accept an existence under the earth, where breath cut off and hearts were still. She would not let the sacrifice be in vain, for Rania's sake. Her mother had wept when she revealed her plan, but she knew her daughter loved to run and climb, to feel the wind in her hair, to wade through the shoals of the river that cut through their city like a lazy serpent. Her forehead still warm with her mother's blessing. She allowed that to calm her as Hades stepped closer, lifting her hands. In one, in one rested the seductive curve of a mango, and the other, a knife. Parvani knew the stories, but it had always been different fruit than this. Figs, peaches, pomegranates. Was the god giving her another homage to her home? She forced herself to take up the knife, and the bone held oddly soft in her grip. Next, she took the mango, already smelling its familiar perfume. The scent was an attack. 
Summer mangoes in the garden, dropping to the ground as if they were falling stars. Branya up in the tree among them, grinning down at her from the very center of the universe. She would try to aim for Parvani's head as she threw them down, her laugh following like a comet's tail. Her lips couldn't determine whether to smile or tremble. Pressing them firmly together, Parvani expertly cut a vibrant orange rope from one side of the mango. Peeling away its skin, she raised the she raised the flesh to her lips. Once you eat it, you can't return. The words were soft. Parvani raised her eyes to Davies. She couldn't make out all her features through the veil, but she thought her eyes might be gray, the same churning coldness of the river she traveled to get here. Keeping their gazes locked, Parvani fed herself the mango. Its nectar filled her mouth like a kiss. Hades lowered her head in recognition. She took the mango and the knife from her hands and cut off a bite, which she ate soundlessly. And then it was done. Parvani was now a bride in time with nectar heavy on her tongue, and her mother's blessing turned cold. All right, we're going to pause there. Uh, so as you probably could tell, this is kind of a haunting, eerie story. Um, it's supposed to be a story about love, but, uh, you know, we started off in the underworld, so it's not going to be your traditional love story. Um, I wanted to share something a little uh, creepy for October, um, and I think this this really will get us in the mood for um, Halloween and scares and things like that. So I'm excited to find out what happens with Parvani and Hades as they continue with their um, adventure in the underworld. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye.